Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name's Chris. I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date's February 5th, 1987, and my home group is the West Portland Group in Portland, Oregon. And I want to thank uh, John for asking me to uh, talk. I, he had uh, he's been met John about three years ago. I spoke at your guys' group, and John and I have become good friends and, and uh, appreciate him asking me. Um, a little bit of what it used to be like, what happened, and what it's like now. Uh, I drank for 11 years, and for whatever reason, in those 11 years, my disease progressed very rapidly. And by the way, I want to welcome all the newcomers. Um, all of us have been new at one time. And uh, congratulations to all the cake takers as well. In those 11 years, I was arrested 15 or 16 times for alcohol-related arrests. I had three DUIs. I was in two treatment centers. I was in detox. I was somebody that had alcohol withdrawal. When I'd come off of alcohol, I was hospitalized for withdrawal. Um, I ended up, I was a daily drinker the majority of my drinking career and ended up becoming a daily oblivion drinker at the end. I was somebody that uh, at the end was, uh, could hold, I could not hold a job. I was literally just living to drink, as they say. Um, it's a blackout drinker. Uh, just to give you guys an idea where my mind can still go today, I was speaking at a group a couple years ago, and uh, before I came in to speak, I was thinking how I was going to start my talk off, and I decided I'd kind of give the, the highlights of my drinking career just like this. I was kind of stand outside and say, okay, 15, 16 alcohol-related arrests, three DUIs, detox, DTs, hospitalization from alcohol withdrawal, wet the bed on a fairly regular basis, and then a little voice inside my head said, maybe I'm not really an alcoholic. <laughs> now, I, I, I recoiled from that thought as if from a hot flame um, because of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, my, my reaction naturally was to recoil. However, untreated... At one time in my life, it was the, that type of insane thinking that would always precede me picking up a drink again. A little thought, like, no matter what the consequences were or how severe they were, um, I would have something in my mind that would convince me that this time's going to be different. And in hindsight, it looks uh, insane, but at the time, it seems real. Um, I would have the thought, like, you know, if I only drink a glass of water in between each drink, then I'll be okay. Now, it's stupid today, but at the time, I'd be like, yeah, that's it. If I just drink a glass of water in between every drink, uh, then the only thing that that ever did is I just wet the bed earlier in the evening rather than later. <laughs> but um, those things don't necessarily, I believe, make me an alcoholic. What makes me an alcoholic is all my life when I wasn't drinking, I always felt different then. I always felt apart from. I always felt extremely inferior and less than and yet it was coupled with that superiority complex. I had this free-floating anxiety when there was no reason to have anxiety. I had depression when there was no reason to have depression. I had this sense of impending doom and sense of impending insanity. I was constantly checking to see if I was sane or not. Um, my mantra was, you know, what's wrong with me? There's something really wrong with me. And alcohol was the solution to that problem. A certain amount of alcohol made me feel like the way that I thought you guys felt. Well, not you guys, but those guys out there felt normally. Um, eight to ten drinks made me feel like how I thought everybody else felt naturally. And the truth is, is that if I could have maintained what eight to ten drinks did for me, I never would have come to Alcoholics Anonymous. The problem is, is that I lost control. I had that phenomenon of craving that as soon as I took a certain amount of alcohol into my system, I would crave alcohol and I would drink to oblivion. Initially, it was occasionally I would lose control, and then it became more and more frequent till the end where every time I drank, I lost control. I was somebody that ended, at the end of my drinking career, at the height of my drinking career, I had a huge tolerance for alcohol. Um, I mean, the, the amount of booze that I was able to put away, I, I wouldn't even say because people would think I was lying. But um, at the end of my drinking, my tolerance fell. I used to be, I had this huge capacity where I could, I could go out, I could drink 15 drinks and I could, I was barely slurring and go, go out and function. At the end of my drinking, I would 
go to a bar and on my fourth drink, there were times where I'd go into a blackout after my fourth drink. It just become totally unpredictable. Anyway, um, fast forwarding, in the fall of 1985, I crossed over an invisible line where I became a daily oblivion drinker. And uh, for, the, for the three weeks after I crossed over that invisible line, I drank to blackout or unconsciousness every day and did nothing else for those three weeks but drink, recover a little bit, and drink. And at the end of three weeks, I had a conversation with myself, and I thought, you know, my God, am I ever going to be able to stop this? And the next thought was, I don't care. This is the happiest I've ever been in my life. They say that alcoholism is the only progressive terminal disease that has a fun phase. And <laughs> and that was my fun phase. And it lasted for about two months. It was up to that point, my drinking had been despair-type drinking. And at that point, when I just, I gave up trying to fight the alcohol because I'd been trying to quit. I'd been trying to control my drinking for some time up to that point. I just gave up. I surrendered to alcohol. and It was the happiest I'd ever been in my life for about two months. And after the two months, once again, I started trying to control. My days consisted of waking up with the guilt, shame, and remorse that I was accustomed to waking up with every day or coming to every day with, patching the night to, before together, you know, piecing the blackout together, um, and swearing off. You know, today, I'm done. And it didn't matter whether I'd woken up in jail or whether it was just a, a night of drinking. I would swear off. I desperately wanted to quit drinking. If when within a few hours my mind, that insanity would, would happen, and I would think, well, maybe if I do it this way tonight, and I'd buy it and drink again, day in and day out. And I drank that way for about the last year and a half of my drinking. <clears throat> in um, June of 1986, I uh, I went into a det I checked in voluntarily to a detox. I wanted to just come off of alcohol, you know, get through the withdrawal, so I was afraid of going to the DTs. And if I could just do that, then I could... I could quit on my own if I could just get through the withdrawals. Uh, went through the detox, you know, five days of Librium and checking my blood pressure around the clock. Stayed for a 28-day inpatient treatment center. Didn't do any of the AA stuff. Just, you know, was going to do it on my own. And within a couple weeks, I was drinking again. Soon after that, I made a geographic to Alaska. Um, I had saw an ad in the, uh, in the uh, newspaper that was a dry logging camp outside of Ketchikan, Alaska. And I thought, that would be the solution. I'll go live on an island where there's no alcohol and, uh, you know, get just put this alcoholism thing behind me. So I went up to Ketchikan, and uh, it was an hour and a half float plane ride out of Ketchikan, got there, and everything went well for three weeks. No uh, cravings for alcohol. There was no booze around. Uh, you know, of course, I got good and drunk before I went to camp. But um, uh, anyway, all went well for three weeks until these two guys showed up with a bottle of whiskey. And I was in my in the bunkhouse, and they said, you know, do you want a drink? And very quickly, my mind went, well, it's been three weeks. I haven't had a drink. I haven't even craved it. I'm probably not really an alcoholic after all. Sure. Grabbed the bottle of booze, tipped it up, and took, went gunk, gunk, gunk. And they grabbed it from me, and they said, hey, we've got to make this last. I, I was under the impression we were going to drink the entire bottle. Now, the problem with that is is that I was an hour and a half float plane ride from Ketchikan, and I had the equivalent of probably about three shots of whiskey in me. And that phenomenon of craving came over me. I laid in bed that night with like an itch that I couldn't scratch, just coming apart. I mean, that's that craving that I could not satisfy. So next morning, I got on a float plane, went into Ketchikan, and um, ended up at the uh, Folksville Bar, which is a legendary bar up there where they the loggers and the fishermen, like, you know, they drink and knife each other and stuff. And um, and just to give you an idea what kind of bar it is, when you order a bottle, if you order, say, Jim Beams, they don't give you a glass of Jim Beams, they give you the bottle of Jim Beams with the glass on top. And um, I drank, uh, I started drinking with this guy from camp named Dan, who was a very nice guy, and after about four drinks, he turned to me and said, you think you're pretty badass, don't you? And then the night just kind of erupted from there. Um, I wound up in jail. Uh, I was a uh, I was a cop fighter, so whenever the police were around, I always felt safe. I wouldn't fight anybody else, but I'd fight the cops because I somehow felt safe fighting them, like they wouldn't take it to the extreme, which uh, that's another form of insanity. <laughs> um, but they uh, they gave me a pretty good beating in, at Ketchikan, and they threw me in a holding cell with two other guys. And uh, since I was fighting, they just threw me in the cell naked and then threw my orange jumpsuit in after me. And uh, 
I, I had concerns about being thrown into a cell that way, and so my alcoholic mind immediately thought a solution, and that was I walked over to the wall and punched the wall naked in front of these two guys and then dropped to the floor and did, did about 25 push-ups, then put on my orange jumpsuit. And in my mind, I thought, I thought what, what, what's going to happen is that this is going to circulate around the jail, and they're going to think, God, this guy is a really badass guy, just got thrown in jail, don't mess with him. The reality is they're like, God, this drunken idiot came in and started doing push-ups naked in the cell. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, I was released in the next day, and um, uh, as I was flying out of Ketchikan, never once did I think about alcohol. I thought, I will never come to Alaska again, because you know, it was always something other than, than that. Um, later that year, at the end of 1986, I ended up down in Ashland, Oregon, where I uh, had done a great deal of my last drinking. I'm from Portland, Portland originally, but I, I ended up down there. I was doing uh, eight days of jail time and um, for my third DUI, and right after doing my eight days of jail, about two days being out, I was arrested again and the, for drinking. And the uh, Ashland Police Department took me aside, and they said, you know, Chris, you've got a hell of a drinking problem. You've got to you've got to do something about this. Go see this guy, Joe Fisher. He's an expert on alcoholism. And I gave him the yes service. You know, yeah, okay, I'll you know, go see Joe Fisher. And um, the next day, I was walking down the street, and there was this uh, sidewalk preacher uh, who would stand and, and read scripture to anybody that would come by. And as I was coming by him, he read something. I have no idea what it was, but he read something. And I took a few steps, and I thought, that kind of correlates with what the cops were saying about going and seeing this guy, Joe Fisher. And I thought, if I was one of those AA people, and there are no coincidences, you know, I would say that this is, you know, my higher power at work and, and fate or something, and that I should go and act on this. I took a few more steps, and I thought, what would happen if for once in my life, you know, I actually did act on something like that and didn't dismiss this stuff as being stupid and trivial and uh, and actually did act on it. And almost out of my own amusement, I turned around and thought, I'm going to go see this guy, Joe Fisher. I went up to see him. As I was heading in, and I had had exposure to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I did not want to be a part of AA. The God thing really bothered me. The fellowship really bothered me. The people really bothered me. Um you know, I just, you know, like everybody in AA, uh, I'm not unique. You know, I just wasn't a joiner. You know, I thought I was the, you know, kind of a loner and so forth. So as I was heading into Joe Fisher's office, I thought, you know, anything but Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, please have gone through aversion therapy, 10 days, a couple two-day follow-ups, and now your life's wonderful. But uh, when I got in there, it wasn't the case. He was a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he did what sober member of the, members of Alcoholics Anonymous do. And that is he shared a little bit of what it used to be like, what happened, what it was like now. At the end of it, he asked me, uh, he said, Dude, would you like to go to a meeting? Now, I didn't want to go to a meeting, but I, had a, I felt kind of a sense of obligation to, to go since I did ask him for help. And um, I went to the Thursday night Clay Street meeting in Ashland. And, uh, you know, I sat in the very back and, uh, um, and I introduced myself as a newcomer. And the speaker it was a it was a speaker discussion meeting. They, the speaker talked for about 20 minutes, and then they called on participants, and each participant talked. And they each participant and the speaker shared a little bit of what it was like, what it or what happened, you know, what it used to be like, what happened, what it's like now. And as they were doing that, I started to identify a little bit. You know, I drank like that. I drank like that. I thought like that. I felt like that, which had never happened in AA prior. Uh, the AA meetings I had gone to before were discussion meetings where they talked about a topic where I, I, I just couldn't identify. I mean, I'm sure they were good topics, uh, but uh, I, I just didn't see how they applied to the fact that I drank the way I drank. But in this meeting, I did identify. And there was a guy there uh, who stood up a couple rows in front of me, and he talked about, his name is Frank, and he talked about coming out of a blackout, holding a revolver in his mouth, going back into the blackout, and then coming to the next morning on the floor with the revolver next to him. And that gave me goosebumps because... I had almost the exact same story. I'd come out of a blackout, and I was holding a carving knife to myself, and went back into the blackout, came to the next day with uh, on the floor with the, the knife next to me. 
And the only difference between his story and my story is somewhere in my blackout, I knifed all the furniture to death. Um, but, but that was very important because I thought I was the only person that ever had done things like that. You know, the only free person that was doing things like that. And so to hear another member of Alcoholics Anonymous who had experienced almost the identical thing, um, it just, you know, it was, it was magic for me. I came out of that meeting with, for the first time with a sense of hope and, um, uh, I stayed sober the next day, which was a big deal because I, I lived with an obsession to drink on a daily basis. I stayed sober the entire next day. And I did drink again and drink for about one week more after that because I didn't keep coming back. And on February 4th, 1987, I went out one more time to prove that I could drink like a normal person. My plan was is I was going to drink 10 drinks that night, and I was going to shut it down by about 10 or 11 o'clock, come home, go to bed, get up the next morning and be like a regular civilian. The guy that was supposed to pick me up and take me to the bars was running late. I drank nine beers in my living room waiting for him to come pick me up and take me to the bars. Ended up down at uh, one bar, and I remember I had you know one hand over one eye. I was drinking vodka Collins in and out of a blackout. Ended up over at another bar, which was my favorite drinking establishment. Uh, and I, was, I came out of a blackout securing a job as a bartender at the bar, um, and I remember as I was having the discussion, because I came in midway, um, I remember thinking, yeah, that's that's the solution. If I'm a bartender, then I can just drink and work and kind of live here. And um, and I won't have the problems that I'm having. And now this bar was a bar that anything goes. I mean, you could get away with anything. I'd never been cut off 86 or anything out of this bar. And this guy who was giving me the job eighty or uh, cut me off that night. And so I grabbed him and pulled him. The guy was going to give me the job. I pulled him across the bar and was going to work him over on the bar. And uh, he weaseled away from me and ended up calling the police. And I ended up getting arrested, um, which really uh, wasn't that big of a deal uh, compared to a lot of the events that I'd gone through in my drinking. But something happened internally inside me. That night I snapped. Um, they, They... they arrested me, and my last conscious thought, they took me home after they uh, had taken me into uh, the station, and uh, my last conscious thought was, I wonder if I'm going to feel this way in the morning, because something was different. And it was. When I got up that next morning, I had hit a bottom. Um, you know, alcohol, as they say, had beaten me into a state of reasonableness. And death did not scare me. Death was a more attractive alternative than to continue living the way I was living. Uh, in fact, had I had a crystal ball that morning that said, you know, if I just drink for another three or six months, I'd be dead, I would have drank till I died. My fear was is I was going to live another year or another two or another five years and continue to spiral down this miserable existence of a life that I'd carved out for myself. And I cried out to a God that I did not want to believe in. I mean, I absolutely did not want to believe in God. And um, I said, God, please make this stop or kill me. And... Uh, I became willing to do whatever they said in Alcoholics Anonymous. Even though the actions in Alcoholics Anonymous, to me, seemed to have no relevance to my drinking problem. They seemed like totally irrelevant actions to the fact that I drank. I couldn't put together drinking and coming to believe in a higher power, or drinking and taking a moral inventory. But I knew from that Play Street meeting that there were people in Alcoholics Anonymous who drank the way I drank, felt the way I felt, and thought the way I thought that were staying sober. And so I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, and immediately the obsession to drink had left me. I just That's my story. Um, I went on February 4th of 1987. I was somebody that lived with an obsession to drink every day. February 5th, the obsession was removed. Um, I believe I did the first three steps that morning. Uh, even though I didn't know what the first three steps were. I think I did them in a very crude way in my heart. Now, I did them out of the book, uh, you know, in a formalized manner with a sponsor later on, but um, I believe I, I believe that's why that obsession was removed. And so came into Alcoholics Anonymous. They told me to go to 90 meetings in 90 days, told me that I had to put first things first, that I had to put my sobriety. If I wanted to stay sober, I had to put my sobriety ahead of everything, above job, family, which is easy to do when you don't have a job. Um, but, you know, put it ahead of everything, and it had to become the most important thing in my life. And I just did as they did. The Lord's Prayer bothered me, but I saw that people who were staying sober were saying the Lord's Prayer, so I said the Lord's Prayer along with them. Um, I got a sponsor. I was in a meeting, uh, and um, I heard this guy say, 
I'd rather have a frontal, or I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. And I was like, I identify with that, you know, and that guy became my sponsor. So um, all went well in my sobriety for about the first 44 days. I was uh, relieved of the obsession to drink. I was starting to feel better, you know, physically healthy. But at 44 days sober, I had a panic attack. And I'd never had a panic attack before. Now, I'd had anxiety throughout when I wasn't drinking, but I never had a full-blown panic attack. And I ended up in the hospital, and, of course, they wanted to give me a this is back when the medical profession uh, thought that um, alcoholism was caused by a Valium deficiency, and they tried to give me, uh, they tr you know, they tried to give me Valium, but I belonged to a group that, you know, warned me about that stuff, and uh, and I just, you know, went through, and I became, in one respect, uh, and I should say this for the new people, um, the God thing, the thing that they told me when I came in is they said. Uh, you don't have to believe in God to make a start in this program. All you have to do is take actions as if you believe in God. And I found out later that in the uh, chapter, We Agnostics, it says that just a willingness to believe is enough of a foundation to make a start. And so I did it. I started faking it till I made it, and I started praying to God that I didn't necessarily believe in. And little by little, I started to form a relationship with a higher power. So from that perspective, my, my sobriety was going good, but I was going crazy at the same time. The panic attacks were on me all the time. I could barely walk down the street. Um, and uh, and the, just the depression and, and, and so forth. Now, finally, what happened is um, I got to a place when I was nine months sober where uh, I just couldn't take it anymore. And I hit another bottom. And I had not done my fourth step, even though I'd been urged by many members of the group and my sponsor uh, to do my fourth step. Uh, but I just hadn't done it. And I got to a place where... I made a decision that I was going to work steps 4 through 12 exactly as they're outlined in the big book. And if I got to step 12 and if I still felt this way, I'd commit suicide. And so I wrote my fourth step and ended up you know, getting together with my sponsor to do my fifth step. And in that fifth step, um, something magical happened to me. And I didn't expect this. I was just did this stuff out of desperation. But um, I had this habit that I had... Uh, started doing years prior where every time I was in a restroom when I wasn't under the influence of alcohol, I would look in the mirror and I'd tear myself down or build myself up. I'd say, you know, this is what's wrong with me, this is what's wrong with me. Or I'd be like, this is what's right with me, this is what's right with me. And, it, and the stuff that was right with me was fleeting. About two minutes later, I'd go right back to being a loser. And um, after I'd done my fifth step, or actually about halfway through my fifth step, I took a break and I went to the restroom and I started to do this, this thing that I'd been doing forever. And I turned to the mirror, and there was no reaction. This always came somewhere from the soul. And um, there was no reaction. And I kind of I stood in the mirror looking at, looking at like, what's this feeling I'm feeling? What's... And I finally identified it, and it was comfort. It was comfort in my own skin. And it was the first time I'd ever had that without a certain amount of alcohol in my system. Two weeks after that, I then stepped six and seven. And um, I did six and seven that day, but two weeks after that, I realized that something internally inside of me had shifted. Now, I didn't believe this stuff in Alcoholics Anonymous was going to work for me, but something inside shifted. The panic attacks subsided. The anxiety, the fear of people started to, to leave. And um, that's when I really became a believer in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, as a result of that, you know, I threw myself into this program even further, immersed myself significantly more. And... Um, went into, did steps 8 and 9, got into 10, 11, and 12. When I was two and a half years sober, I, and, you know, and since this is kind of a workshop format, I'll tell you a little bit about um, one of the things in the seventh step. Some of my character defects were removed immediately. Some of them, just some of the character defects was removed, and some of them just hardly scratched the surface on them. And one of the things I was taught was that I had to live in step seven. And the way I lived in step seven was that I could not turn this stuff over to God and go turn the TV on and expect God to, you know, magically remove some of these character defects, although that was the case with some of them. Others, I had to go out and act as if God was removing them. I, I was taught that alcoholics can't think their way into a new way of acting or feel their way into a new way of acting, that I had to take actions and act as if it was okay until it felt okay. And... Um, and I, believe, I think that's what they mean by in the 12 by 12 where it says, God will not render us white as snow without our cooperation. That is my cooperation. 
getting out there. I can't expect to have fears removed uh, unless I'm getting out there and willing to start walking through the fear. As one of my spiritual advisors says, you know, our path is through the fire, not around it. And once we step into the fire, we realize that it was an illusion. And so little by little, I started walking through fears because fear was the chief, you know, self, self-centeredness is the root of my problem. I'm tr- I have, I have all hundred forms of fear, you know, and, um, and so I had to walk through a lot of fear. And I went from somebody who at one time in my life, if I was sober, dry, not drinking, if I was walking down the sidewalk and somebody was coming the other way, I would cross the street so I wouldn't have to have eye contact with the person to where I, little by little, that fear was removed and I could start talking to people and looking at people without being anesthetized with a certain amount of alcohol. At two and a half years sober, um, I had an intuitive thought. Uh, one of the things that's important for me on, on intuitive thoughts is I don't really know that they're intuitive thoughts. They don't come with a, a sign saying, this is an intuitive thought. Um, so I have, to, I, have to, I have to make the assumption that it's an intuitive thought, that I am being God-directed. I have to go back to that choice I made in step two that says that God is either everything or he's nothing. What's my choice to be? And I still have to do that today. My, and my, so when I get those intuitive thoughts, I have to choose that this could be an intuitive thought and act on it. Uh, and I still have that part of me that wants to dismiss all that stuff as kind of hokey. But when I take the action on it, I haven't been misled yet. Uh, I had an intuitive thought at two and a half years sober where I realized that all my life I was afraid of looking bad and losing. And so I wouldn't participate in life unless I was assured of looking good and being number one. I was like, I would never step into the batter's box and swing the bat for fear of striking out. And this, and what I realized that uh, for normal people, they step into the batter's box, and if they hit a, they you know they hit a home run or something, that's success. If they strike out, it's failure. And the intuitive thought for me was that that doesn't apply. Just me stepping into the batter's box and trying and turning over the outcome is success. And so with that um, intuitive thought, I ended up becoming getting into the uh, investment banking business at two and a half years sober. I went from somebody that couldn't hold a job, no driver's license, and so forth, to getting into investment banking. Several years later, I ended up owning my own investment bank, um, which I still own today. You know, and, and it's all as a result of this program, and it's not me doing it. And I guess that's what I'll, I'll probably close on is that um, in uh, one of the books, uh, A Comes of Age, they talk about the amazing rejuvenating powers of the alcoholic ego. And for me, that doesn't mean the big shotism and all that kind of stuff returns. What it means is that after a certain amount of sobriety, after I start feeling good, little by little I start taking credit for the things in my life that were actually God-given and as a result of practicing principles in my life. And, um, and so... I have to live in step 11, not so much I do meditation, but not that part of step 11, but that part where I remind myself throughout the day that I'm not running the show. I I confirm what the decision I made in that third step where I I decided that I would no longer play the director and that from here on out, God would be the director and I'd be his agent. And the 11th step where it says, you know, I'm no longer running the show. My life by me today is as unmanageable today as it was when I got here. And um, Alcoholics Anonymous is, you know, there's only two things that have ever worked for me in, in life, and that was a certain amount of alcohol and a certain amount of Alcoholics Anonymous. It says, uh, I think that's on page 25, where it talks about we have two choices. We can blot out, you know, our existence to the miserable end the best we can through drinking, or we can accept spiritual help. And for me, the reason being is because if I'm not, do, if not, if I'm not drinking, or if I'm not doing a certain amount of AA, life's too uncomfortable for me to live in. Uh, life, untreated alcoholism manifests with me through anxiety, depression, loneliness, loneliness even when I'm amongst people, um, a sense of not being a part of and belonging. And so I need something to take care of that. I need relief and recovery from that. And I need it from either a certain amount of alcohol or I need it from a certain amount of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, you know, I am so grateful to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, somebody that hated this program when I came here, and I 
came to love it because it worked so well in my life. Um, you know, like I said, there's only been two solutions that have worked for me, alcohol and this program. And the, the gifts of this program are just, have just been amazing. Everything in my life today is a result of trying to live this thing. You know, living it as a design for living. Not necessarily in here, because this is the easiest place for me to live it. But going out and really doing the deal out there on the streets. So, anyway, with that, I want to thank you, and I'll open it up for questions. Yeah, the question was, is what do I do with a new sponsee and you know, what kind of directions do I give them and so forth? Um, I have uh, newcomers call me every day. I give them a call time because I sponsor quite a few people, so I have to have them on a schedule. And I uh, get them into the big book. I have them go through the doctor's opinion. I have them look at the phenomenon of craving, uh, the restless, irritable, and discontent unless they experience, you know, experience relief from a certain amount of drinks. Or if they're like me, I take them to the part where it says they're maladjusted to life and full flight from reality and outright mental defectives. And because uh, 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 irritable, restless, and discontent is like a, an understatement for me. Um, and I take them through that and have them uh, identify themselves as alcoholics and make sure they're alcoholics. And I, you know, I listen to their story. Um, and uh, and then I have them read the first four chapters and uh, look at the. In uh, We Agnostics, where it talks about several times, it says we have to lay aside prejudices. I point out that it doesn't say we have to rid ourselves of those prejudices. It just says that we have to lay them aside. And um, and then I get them finally to that place where it says A, B, and C. And as is being convinced, you're at step three, and I take them into step three. So I just have them do essentially as the book outlines. You know, I have them read the stories. It says, you know, our, our, the description of the alcoholic, the chapter of the agnostic, and our personal interest before and after make clear of these three pertinent ideas. And um, I spend a great deal more time in steps one and two than I used to. Um, I used to rush them through that, and I've, I've had some people that have succeeded in a lot of the program and ended up failing because they never really got step one or two. And I will not advance uh, unless they've gotten. Uh, question was living amends. Um, yeah, uh, the two words I'm sorry are probably two of the most overused words I ever used before coming here. And so the living amends, especially the family, uh, were, were significant. And, um, you know, I'm not somebody that did, you know, some people do like they write their parents a card every week and, you know, do that kind of stuff. But I make myself available and of service to my family. And just do that consistently, uh, not always well, but, um, you know, I went from somebody that was kind of the black sheep of the family, to, you know, the one, I mean, my brother's a major league baseball player. My dad was a major league baseball player and professional football player. And I'm like the guy that goes to jail, you know, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, um, but I went from the guy that was in jail to through these living amends to the person that when my brother was negotiating his contract two years ago, I got a call at 2 a.m. He was in the hotel room asking me my, my advice on how to, you know, his agent and the owners were in the next room and was asking me my advice on what deal he should take. My dad calls and asks me for his advice or for my advice in his life. And, um, and that's through the living amends. Uh, but, you know, sometimes I hear people when they talk about living amends, it sounds like that they're like, they're like these dream spouses or kids. Still made mistakes. I've had to make amends within the living amends. Um, because I'm, you know, step 10 promises me that I am going to continue to make some mistakes. But, um, so I think that, uh, does that answer that? Thanks. The question was, uh, can I talk about, um, a suggestion for people that have still are working a good program but have free-floating anxiety. Uh, I can because um, I still, you know, even though the panic attacks have subsided for the most part, I still have anxiety. I think that might be because I'm human and uh, I still have human emotions. My problem centers in my mind. In the back of the big book, there's a, a medical opinion by Dr. Bauer that talks about the excessive concentration on oneself I'm somebody that has the excessive concentration on myself. 
I constantly am monitoring and taking my emotional temperature. You know, as like when I speak, a lot of times the first five minutes when I speak, I think, God, I'm having rubber legs. You know, my legs are getting rubbery. I'm going to pass out. Oh, my God. You know, as I'm talking about something totally different. Um, that self-obsession and self-centeredness is difficult for, for me to break. I'm somebody that actually, when I get anxiety, if I focus on the anxiety, or if I get depression, I focus on the depression. So, like, I need to do something about this anxiety. It grows and becomes worse. But if I get into the solution of Alcoholics Anonymous, and in the 10th step, the final thing that it says is it says, we turned our thoughts to someone we can help. When I'm thinking about somebody else's needs and how I can help them and how I can carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, I have that self-forgetfulness, and the anxiety is not there. Uh, you know, a great example of that is I have asthma, and I was um, driving on this mountain road last year, and it was I was like an hour away from the nearest hospital or two hours away from the nearest hospital, and I didn't have an inhaler. And, of course, I started thinking, my God, what if I have an asthma attack? You know, so then pretty soon I start feeling the asthma come on. I'm like, I think I am having an asthma attack. And so I'm almost at the panic stage because I'm obsessed about asthma. And a car had rolled over on this mountain road and was in a ditch. And I drove past and I thought, God, I better go see if those people are, if there's people in that car. So I turned around, went back, and I couldn't pull over. So I had to drive back, pull around, got out of my car, went down, looked to see if there was any people in the, in the car, uh, you know, to see if they needed any help. And they were gone. And, um, uh, I mean, they weren't gone, like gone, but um, they, do, they weren't in their car. And, uh, and I, uh, I got back in my car and started driving, and all of a sudden I realized I don't have any asthma. That because when I thought about somebody else's needs and broke that excessive concentration on myself, I was able to break that self-obsession. And um, another story that... Uh, I'll tell you about that. I have a friend who lives down here who teaches uh, special education. And in her uh, special education class, she has a one of her students is a very high-functioning student, but he has a horrible stutter. And But other than that, he's very high-functioning. And she uses him to help with the other students because they don't function as well as he does. Whenever he's immersed in helping the other students, he loses his stutter. So that's the case with me, anxiety or whatever it may be. My solutions generally are not focusing on the problem. It's taking actions that seem to have no relevance to the problem. Thanks. Yes. The most stressful thing I've had to deal with in my sobriety, um, when I was uh, six years sober, I started very slowly getting away from Alcoholics Anonymous. And... Um, the cunning, baffling, powerful part of that is my life went well for about the first year. I was somebody that had a huge spiritual experience, and yet I still drifted away from A. I mean, it, you know, like it says, it's easy to rest on your laurels. And I always swore I'd never be one of those people, and I did. And um, all the, the craziness that I experienced in my first year of sobriety um, happened uh, at seven years sober. And re-immersing myself back in Alcoholics Anonymous and walking through that was one of the most difficult things. Um, my wife was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis about two years ago, and we had to walk through that. One year ago today, one of my sponsees committed suicide, and um, walking through that was tough. I immediately took responsibility for that, I, uh, and I was, you know, stunned, you know, and um, and uh, so I've walked through, you know, that sort of adversity. And never once did I have, you know, a thought that a drink would make it better, not because of anything that comes from me, but as a result of, you know, trying to rely on a power that I still don't necessarily understand and taking the actions of this program. Question was, is as I'm doing business, how do I bring God into that quotient? Well, uh, business was one of the last places I practiced the principles. I used to rule with a, uh, you know, the iron fist and fear and intimidation. And uh, I, I said, this is just business. And this is kind of like my AA Part of my AA program went out the door when I came into business, um, and I've changed that uh, in the last. I've been it's been an evolution for the last ten years. So how do I bring God into it today? Is I bring God into my business today. I offer a service that people need, and I do it honestly and fairly and straightforward. And um, you know, I, I Chuck Chamberlain's book. Uh, 
you know, you know, the retreat that's in print form, A New Pair of Glasses. There's a chapter on that, on uh, doing business and practicing principles in business. And I found that, you know, when I was operating from self-will and ruling with an iron fist and, and so forth, business was good, but being straightforward and honest and really practicing the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous in my business, business is far better. This, how do I deal with the stress of my job? Uh, you know, God is either everything or he's nothing. And, uh, you know, I'm powerless over the stock market and the bond market and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I just, you know, I do prayer and meditation and just the basic actions of this uh, of this program. Am I done or do I have one more? Okay. Yes. question was, is how did I take responsibility for the suicide of my sponsee? Um, yeah, how did I let go of it? Uh, just by continuing to work this program, I, you know, I, I did a 10-step inventory. I got together with uh, one of my spiritual advisors and I uh, read it to him, and I did it one day at a time. Initially, it was a shock. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know why that happens, but I, I took responsibility as if. I mean, my first thought was I killed him, and, um, and. I just had to walk through it one day at a time and, and keep reminding myself that I'm not running the show. And, uh, and I talked to a lot of people, you know, and, uh, talked to a lot of other alcoholics that knew him and, um, and just kept walking through it. And little by little, I, you know, dig it through. I was nervous about speaking today because I thought initially that, you know, uh, because it was one year ago today. And, um, you know, so it's still with me to a certain extent. But uh, nothing like it was initially. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.